here. And I thank you, Lord, for their commitment to dig into your word, to search your scriptures, to accurately handle the word. And Lord, tonight, as we focus on how to uh, look at the word for application, Lord, we want to hear you speak to our hearts. Lord, we want to know you and we want to be known of you. And so, Lord, now as we walk through the process, we ask the Holy Spirit to reveal truths to us tonight in a fresh way. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oops. We want to focus on application. And I sent you an email with our notes on it. Uh, and what I'd like for us to do is just first look at what application is. One of the things that we notice is that um, application really is the, um, the least, you know, exercise of the inductive process. We will um, observe and we will interpret. And once you observe and interpret, especially for interpretation, uh, the definitions will always be the same. They'll never change. But application, and, and just as many of you said tonight as you read Psalms 119, some of you said, you know what, it's been a while since I read it. But as a result of reading it over, well, one, we're in you're in a new place and it takes on a whole fresh meaning. And so we will always be, as long as we're on this side of eternity we will always have an opportunity to apply the word. So application is powerful in, in that we will all, we, as long as we're in this flesh, in these mortal bodies, we will always be in a posture to apply the word. But we can't apply it if we don't properly uh, study it. And so that's why I love the inductive method because it is the one method that helps you to truly accurately handle the word. You let the word say what it says. You keep the word in con the keep the content. You 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 keep it in context. You don't take it out of context. You don't make the word say what it's not saying, you read what's above it and what's below it. Uh, you, 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 you're you able to compare and contrast. You're able to even look maybe culturally at, at, at what's going on and, and, and you can read it. I sent you that information on how to get the most out of your reading time. Because, okay, reading is where we get our observation from. So application, again, is the most neglected, yet it's the most important and needful step of the inductive process. Observation and interpretation without application equals abortion. We will become a forgetful hearer of the word when we don't apply it. And I, I highly recommend that you read uh, Howard Hendricks' book, Living by the Book. He goes really in depth on explaining uh, application, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, observation, interpretation, and application. So observation and interpretation it equals understanding. You get a greater understanding because when you observe what was obscure now becomes very clear. And when you interpret it, 
by looking up definitions and getting a, a more, a greater insight, that equals understanding. And it's what we understand. That's what we're able to apply. And we want to apply the word as it relates to our daily lives. And I sent you the, um, the email on um, how to self-inventory, because that is what application is. It's taking inventory of yourself, allowing, using the word. In fact, the Bible says that we are to examine ourselves and you want to examine your heart. So um, how does it apply to my life? That's the real question with application. The purpose of studying and meditating on the word is for the word to transform our lives. That's what we want. We don't just want to be heady and high-minded and full of information. We want transformation. The goal is transformation. So it is possible to become intellectually fascinated and spiritually frustrated when you refuse to be morally changed by the word. And there's a reference to that in the New Testament where Paul says of, of what would be taking place in the last days. He says that men would be ever learning and never coming into the knowledge of. And there's a reason why we can do this. And we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. So the goal is to allow the word to make a permanent difference in your character and conduct. And so it is, it's a search me, oh God, try me, see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me into the way that is everlasting. So what we want to do is we want to give the word permission. We want to approach the word with the mindset of word, you be the mirror for me. And whatever you show me, because that's what the word does. It'll show you who God is and it'll show you who you are in light of what the word has to say. So there is no substitute for applying the word. None. There is no substitute. If you study, let's say you just really learn how to accurately handle the word. You can study it. You can slice it and dice it. You can look up the definitions, do the cross-reference, even be able to speak Greek. You can be full of wisdom and knowledge, but if it's never applied, then transformation is not going to take place. And God, God's purpose for the word is so that we can know his heart and we can also know our heart because that's what the word does. It reveals the heart. In fact, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Jeremiah, the 17th chapter. And this is one of my, um, I love, love, love this passage in Jeremiah. Um, Jeremiah chapter 17, and most of you are familiar with the verse right beneath it. We are familiar with um, verse 9, Jeremiah uh, 17, 9. But I want you to look, let's, I tell you what, and keeping it in context, let's go to Jeremiah 17, 5. And um, I hope you got it in your Bibles. If not, you can listen. Um, it says, thus saith the Lord, cursed is a man who trusted man and make flesh his strength, whose heart depart from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert. Now for the man who depart from the Lord, and the way we depart from the Lord is by neglecting his word and by neglecting prayer, and by neglecting meditating and communicating with the Lord. He says, for he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes. 
Now, here's what this passage says to me. It says that God will send good in our life. He will send good to us. But because we are not trusting in him and we're trusting in flesh or we're trusting in things or we're trusting in money or we're trusting in the things that only man can do. He says, when we do that, First of all, we're going to be like a shrub in the desert, dry and desolate. And when good comes, because good is coming, we will not see it. Uh, The scripture is found in Jeremiah 17, starting with verses uh, 5. And now I'm reading verse 6. Nope. I'll read verse six. It says, um, for he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good come, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabited, nor is there anything that will bear fruit in this place. But then it says in verse seven, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. So now you have two types of men that's being addressed. You have the man who trusts in man, The Bible says the consequences of trusting in man is going to be, you're going to be cursed. It says that you're going to, you're not going to see good when it comes, meaning good is going to come, but you're going to miss it. But then in verse seven, there's a contrast. It says, but blessed is a man who trusts in the Lord. So you can trust in man or you can trust in the Lord. But if you trust in the Lord, he says, and if your hope is in the Lord, he says, That man, in verse 8, shall be like a tree planted by waters, which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes. But its, its leaves will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. And then most of us are familiar with verse nine, for the heart is deceitful above all things. But if we go back to verse five, dealing with trusting in man, as opposed to trusting in God, the words clearly says, you trust in man, this is what you're going to get. But if you trust in God, if you're trusted in the Lord, if your hope is in him, he says, You will be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaves will be green. So when heat is coming, so there are two things that's coming. Good is coming and heat is coming. Doesn't matter where any of us live. Doesn't matter what we're doing. You can, doesn't matter what your status is, good is coming to all of us and heat is coming. Heat is speaking of trials and testings or suffering. But the Bible promised that when the heat comes, you will still be fruitful. You will still bear fruit. And based on what's going on currently in our day, I can see a heat, a a firestorm coming. But the Bible says you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to fret. You don't have to be anxious. You don't have to be fearful. You don't have to worry because the promise of God's word is if you are trusting in God and if your hope is in him and in his word, then guess what? 
when he comes, you will still bear fruit. So you don't have to be anxious in the year of drought because you will continue to bear fruit. Now, I don't know about you all, but that is wonderful news. So back to our, how does it apply to my life? That was just a little sidebar. Okay. There's no substitute for applying the word, not interpretation, not superficial obedience. You know, and you may say, well, what is superficial obedience? Well, superficial obedience is you read the word and you obey the word in areas where you know you're not already struggling in. You, It's like, you know what? If you're already paying tithe, when you read that word, it's like, guess what? You're already obeying God in that area. But and, and what we like to do, our human nature is, is to focus on the areas where we're strong. And when we read that those passages, we like to just kind of hang our hat there. So what we want to do is we want the word to have free course. And we don't want superficial obedience. We want complete obedience. We want unconditional obedience. If God says it, and we want to give God permission to say whatever you want to say and to speak into our lives the way he wants to speak. So there's no substitute for applying the word, not rationalization for repentance. And you know, how we can, we can, our, in our human nature, we can rationalize away anything we want to. The human nature, we can just do it. We can give just cause as to why we shouldn't repent. Uh, and whether it's thinking different or, you know, if we want to keep thinking like the world think and, and God, Jesus is saying, you have heard it said, but I say, you've heard the words world say, but God is saying. And so we want to listen to what God is saying and we don't want to rationalize anything. If we are thinking wrong, if we are doing wrong, we want to just repent, just agree with God, confess. Confess means to call it what God calls it, agree with God. And then uh, not an emotional experience for a volitional decision. You know, it's one thing to just weep at the hearing of the word and get real excited and rejoice and dance and say how happy the word makes us. But if we don't get up and make a conscious decision, will to do something different, then we're still not applying the word. And I love what James says in James 125. He says, the one who looks intently at the perfect law the law of liberty and abide by it, not having become a forgetful hearer. That's supposed to be hero, ladies. A forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer. This man shall be blessed in what he does. And that takes us right back to Psalms 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. The man who delights himself in the law of the Lord, he will be blessed. And so now, the way to uh, properly apply the word, here's what we need to do. We need to know the text, and that's what we're doing with inductive. You need to know yourself. You need to know the text. Inductive study helps you to know the text. And that's what I love. I love this method because it, there, it leaves nothing for guessing. Nothing is ambiguous. Nothing, nothing is left obscure. When you inductively study the word, even that which is obscure, when you are observing and start to interpret, it becomes very obvious and very uh, clear and, and, and vivid for you to understand. So, what is obscure, it becomes very apparent. That's what inductive does. It helps you to know the text. But when you know the text, you want to move from knowing the text to knowing 
yourself. And the way you know yourself is you do personal inventory. And I sent you all some information on uh, personal inventory in, in just um, from, a, from a practical sense. Uh, even, even this, you want to know your, yourself in your personal life. You need to know what your spiritual gifts are. You know what? You need to know what your spiritual strengths are. Where are you strong? How are you doing spiritually? What, you know, are you, are you faithfully, are you consistently, uh, what are your strengths in your spiritual walk? What, what are your weaknesses? And be honest about those. And if you don't, if you're not, then you're going to fall short in truly applying the word. You're going to walk away without the word accomplishing its purpose. Um, and, and you want revelation knowledge. And you want the experience that Isaiah had. He said when he saw the Lord, he saw the Lord. And that's what inductive study does. It helps you to see God. And then when you see God, you should have the same experience that Isaiah had. He said, you know, well, he saw himself, you know, he gave his description of what he saw in the Lord. And then he gave him his description of, of how he saw himself. And Isaiah was very honest. You know, he said, I'm an unclean man with unclean lips. And I've been in the midst of unclean people. And that's what happens when we see God in, 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 in th the enthroned God, when we see the holy God. So here's what we want to do. You want to know yourself, your personal life. You want to know yourself spiritually. You want to know yourself physically. Uh, are, are, you, are you committed to your physical health? Because we are three part. We are spirits. We live in a body and we have a soul. And the three are really impacted by the other. It is when you are not physically well, it taxes you. And when you can be, and sometimes God will allow infirmities in our lives to work things in us spiritually, to build character in us. But you want to know where you are. And there's certain things that you can do preventive wise. Are you doing those things? Are you, you know, uh, drinking water? Are you resting? Are you? And if you're not doing that, then there's some body abuse that's going on. And it's the temple of God. Your body doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the Lord. And so you want to know yourself physically, know your strengths, know your weaknesses emotionally. You know, do you know your emotional strength? Do you know your emotional intelligence? Do you, you know, uh, sometimes we don't allow ourselves to have all of the emotions that's possible. You know, we will, we will own being happy or we'll own being angry, but there are other emotions in the spectrum of emotional experiences. Uh, are we in tune to that? Especially things like grief, you know, do, are you aware of, of, of how you respond to loss? Uh, because the, all of these can impact you spiritually. So you want to know yourself. And then when you are attuned, in tune and aware of who you are in these areas, when you read the word, you will allow the word to speak to you in those areas. And then know yourself financially, you know, what kind of, you know, financial uh, intelligence do you live in? Are you impulsive? Uh, where are you uh, when it comes to managing and being a good steward? Because your financial intelligence can have a lot to do with what's going on in your heart. Really, all of these can be a reflection of what's going on in your heart. It's a, they can be a symptom. That's why it's important to know them. And then your family life. Know your family life, your spouse. 
you know, what's going on there. And see, because when you get in the word, there's the order that God has. Sometimes I've gone to the word and I just wanted to soak in the presence of God. And I just wanted heaven to open up. And I just wanted Jesus to speak to me. And I just wanted to enjoy my communion and fellowship with God. And there have been times where I've done that. And just said, you know, I remember and I shared this, uh, I think, in the book that I wrote. I said, Lord, I said, God, what would you have me to do? Because the presence of God was so thick. And I said, God, what would you have me to do? And I was waiting for God to share something phenomenal, just something awesome. And the Holy Spirit said, go cook Vernon some beans. And I thought, Lord Jesus, the devil is a liar. And I began to rebuke Satan. I said, Satan, in the name of Jesus, I bind you. And little did I know that that was the voice of God. And I never expected God to interrupt my time with him for me to uh, cook Vernon some beans. But God, he had a plan in my cooking those beans because it opened up and it created an atmosphere in our home where God came in and it was just precious and God just used the atmosphere because as women, that's what we do. We create atmosphere in our home and with your children, your family life, do your children, do you, do your children see your face light up when you walk, when they walk in the room, when, when they're communicating with you, do they know that, um, that they are truly, loved by you? Do they do they have to question whether or not, I don't mean you letting them have whatever they want to have, but do are they secure in your love? And then are, are, are we training and nurturing them in the things of God? Are you and your husband prayer partners, uh, aging parents, you know, your family life? The Bible says, honor your parents, you know, and it'll be well with you. Honoring them doesn't mean let them manipulate you and play with you. Honoring them means biblically doing what God says to do as it relates to your aging parents. And then, of course, you want the word to speak to you as it relates to your career life. Are you honest in your job? Do you follow through in commitments? You know, can your boss trust you to get the job done? Uh, do you stay current with new ideas? Are you innovative? What what kind of an asset are you to the business that you're in? And th there is a story that I tell um, for the sake of time. I won't tonight, but I remember I worked at V of A, um, and uh, I was I had an attitude because I didn't want to work, and my husband wanted to make sure that I would um, know how to work and could go in the workplace because I was a stay at home mom. And all I wanted to do was just stay in school. So I was out at the college taking classes and he decided he wanted me to go to school full time. I mean, part time. And I just know he wanted me to go to work part time because I was going to school full time. And he was like, I think you need to, you need some experience with work. So anyway, I had an attitude and I remember God came to me and spoke to me and said, I want you to work this desk and work with these clients as though I'm standing over your desk as your supervisor. And that was, and, and then the, the verse came to me, you know, in everything you do, let it be done as unto the Lord. So anyway, God wants to penetrate every area of our life. And he wants to use the word to speak to every area, your church life. Are you submitted to leadership? Are you loyal to leadership? Do you pray for your pastors? Do you support the vision? Do you know what the vision is? Are you consistent in giving? Uh, and do you give as unto the Lord? Um, are you using your spiritual gifts? Do you know what your spiritual gifts are? Uh, because we are all functioning. We're all, we are all a functioning part in the body of Christ. And we have to know where we function. Um, and we function best based on what our gifts are. And so if you've never, ever 
taking a test to find out what your spiritual gift is, shoot me an email and say, I'd like to know what my spiritual gift is. And I'll send you some information whereby you can go through this test. It asks very practical questions. And at the end, it can let you know what your spiritual gift is. Um, in fact, there's a link I can send to you. Also, your community life. Are you an informed voter? Listen, especially if you are a person of color, you have a responsibility to vote. People died. People were jailed for your to be able to vote for the for the privilege of you voting. And you know what? A lot of us don't like doing jury duty. But let me tell you, there is a need for godly men and women to uh, sit in on, on juries and to do jury duties. Um, it's, well, I won't even go into that, but we do. We need to be there. We need to be there. We need to be praying. And we, need, we are called the salt of the earth. And God would use us there. Uh, uh, do you pay your taxes? Uh, do you have good driving records? Uh, are you meeting the needs of the poor? These are things that you let, these are ways you let your light shine in your community. And then one of the ways we can uh, apply the word is by relating. So you got to know the word, you got to know yourself, and you've got to relate. Once we know the truth of God's word, we must then relate it to our experiences. Our experience is that we have been made new in Christ Jesus. Our new life in Christ is a series of new relationships. I remember when I got saved, everything, I'm telling you, the sky looked bluer, the grass looked greener, colors were more vivid. When I was made alive in my spirit, I knew it. And 2 Corinthians 5.15 says, if any man is in Christ, he is, that man is a new creature. All things are passed away. And so the new things, we have a new relationship with yourself. You have a new relationship with yourself. You have a new relationship with others. You have a new relationship with the enemy. At least now you're aware that there is an enemy. Then you have a, a, a new relationship. You have a relationship with the word of God. And what the word does is the word exposes your sin. That's what we want it to do. We don't just want to get spiritual goosebumps when we read the word. We want the word to cut. We want the word to expose. We don't, and the word never condemns. If, you ever, if you're ever reading the word and you feel condemned or beat up, then that is not the Holy Spirit. Because the, Holy, the word never condemned. The word, it will convict, it will instruct, it will encourage, and it will lead us into right living. But the word never condemned. Jesus said he did not come to judge the world or to condemn it, but that the world, the world through him would know life. And I'm paraphrasing that. So now why would, why would the word, the word which was written by the Holy Spirit, why would it condemn us if Christ didn't? So there is no condemnation. So let the word expose sin. And what you do is as soon as the word can expose the sin, John says, when you confess your sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And listen, you walking around feeling bad because you sin, it doesn't purif that doesn't purify you. What purifies you is when you confess that sin. You, yeah, you can have a godly sorrow. But that godly sorrow is supposed to lead to repentance. So you want to ask God to forgive you. And then you want to get up from it and walk away and don't even think about it again. Because to think about it again after you've sincerely had a godly sorrow and repented in faith, you believe that God has forgiven you 
walk away. It do, I don't care what it is. It can be an abortion. It can be a, a homosexual lifestyle. It can be, because, you know, we like to classify sin. It can be murder. It can be whatever. Betrayal. Whatever it is, there is no sin. To, to think that you have a sin that the blood can't cleanse is to say that your sin is greater than who Jesus is. Okay. So I'll get off my soapbox. Now, the word gives God, it'll give you God's promise. Now, this is the part of the word we love. We love to read the promises. And we should read the promises because they encourage us. And the word to be encouraged means to give strength. When we read the word of God and we are encouraged, it gives us strength. And then the word gives you God's commands. The word gives you uh, examples to follow. When you when we look up the cross reference verses, what we get we get illustrations, and then those illustrations will give us an example of what that particular verse says. And so what we're going to do is the word. Okay, to know, to know God, in order to apply the word, we've got to know the word, you've got to know yourself, you've got to be able to relate, and not. And now you want to meditate. And that's something that we're going to work on, meditating. Because what meditation does, it provides the mind with the fuel it needs to meditate. The word, I'm sorry, memorization, memorization, when we memorize the word, it provides the mind with the fuel it needs to meditate. And that's why repetition is so powerful. And that's why taking our time and dissecting the word, we become familiar with it. That, that gives us the memory, the verse, we hide it in our hearts. We store it in our minds. We store it in our hearts. And then we're able to retrieve it to meditate on it because we've become uh, consistently digging into it. Now, then practice. We have to just do it. Be consistent. And consistency is a challenge. And with consistency, we need fellowship to be consistent. We need accountability to be consistent. And that's why small groups are so powerful because you have people that you uh, connect with that is praying for you, that is encouraging you, and that you really want to uh, finish strong with. So here are some questions you want to always ask the text. Whatever it is you're studying, you want to always ask the question to that word. Look at the word and say, is there an example to follow? Is there a sin to avoid? Is there a promise to claim? Is there a prayer to repeat? Is there a command to obey? Is there a condition to meet? Is there a verse to memorize? Is there an error to mark? Is there a challenge to face? These are the questions that we want to always ask the scriptures. Now, so what I want us to do, I want us to look at Matthew. Um, turn in your Bibles to Matthew, or if you have your notes, Turn to Matthew 4, verse 17. And we want to look at the verse. We want to look at Matthew. And we want to see if we can use these questions to the text. Matthew 4, 17 reads... From memorization or from memor from memorizing it. And from that time, 
Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So we should have come up with questions when we look at this particular verse. Now, these are some examples of questions, but you can ask your own questions. What questions you ask for application, it could come out of your who, what, when, why, where, and how questions when you're actually doing your observation and interpretation. So God can begin to speak to you. I find that the Holy Spirit speaks to me when I'm when I'm looking, when I'm searching. So the question then, if we go through the list, is there an example to follow? Um, what would the example be? I think uh, the example would be um, thinking different. And through our cross-reference verses, we would come up with illustrations and examples of people who thought different. Or one of the things I found in doing this study on repent, I found that just thinking different is apl- that's a form of application. Just thinking different. Because when I think different, I am going to make different choices. Or you may be able to come up with your own example. And that's what I love about the application. There's no set answer because we're all uniquely different. We're all in different places. So even as these questions are asked, we can all come up with different answers. And that's what made groups so powerful. So is there a sin to avoid? And if we look at some of our questions from our who, what, when, why, where, uh, we could say that the sin to avoid would be uh, refusing to repent, refusing to think different, refusing to let the mind of Christ be in us. That's the sin to, to avoid. Is there a promise to claim? Well, the promise to claim would come out of our answers when we ask the question, uh, what are the benefits of thinking difference? What is the benefit of repentance? There was a promise of being refreshed. And I'm just saying this from memory. I'm not pulling up the notes. But there's a promise that there would be a refreshing. There was a promise of salvation if we repented. So see, this is how you can go back and use your list of what you observed and and what you interpreted. I hope this is making sense. Is there a prayer to repeat? Now, the prayer to repeat would come as a result of your looking at that passage. And just writing out your own prayer. You can write out a prayer. You, What I find is that I have a journal. And when I'm studying the things that God speak to me, I will write down what God is saying to me, what he's speaking to my heart. And then I will turn around and acknowledge through either confessing or through either agreeing or through even asking for help or asking God to uh, give me strength, ask the Holy Spirit to work this in me. So those, uh, the prayer to repeat can come as a result of that. Uh, Is there a command to obey? Yes, the command is to repent. Is there a verse to memorize? And of course, we want to memorize each one of the verses because we're doing this for the purpose of meditating. And then, is there an error that we need to mark uh, when we look up 
the cross-reference verses when we see um, things that were done wrong, people who did the opposite, uh, then we want to make note to that because we want to avoid that error. And if we are making the same error, that's a good place right there to just stop and repent, stop, agree with God, think his thoughts, and then um, do something different, go another way. Is there a challenge to face? Uh, when we look at, uh, I believe it's Philippians, think on these things. Uh, because to think different is, and, and what you'll notice, the more you read uh, Matthew, what you're going to see is Jesus raising the level of consciousness of the people there. And he, he said, he said over and over again, you have heard it said, but I say, or uh, it has once been said, but I say, you've heard it said, um, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, if your brother offends you, forgive. I'm paraphrasing. Or you've heard it said, you know, that a man should not commit adultery. But I say, if you look upon a woman with lust in your heart. And, and what you find when you, when you see the, the challenge is, Jesus is saying, a lot of what was said before addressed behavior. But what I'm saying now, I'm, I'm addressing your heart. Because if your heart change, your behavior will follow. And so those are the questions that we want to ask uh, the text. So with, in doing that, what we will do is we will the, make this word become relevant to us in the whole of our lives. We are not to just sit down. It's a religious practice. If we just sit down and 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 read the word and commune with God and pray and not let that word follow us, not let that word impact us. You know, when 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 who was that? I believe it was Peter when Peter tried to deny Jesus. Uh the woman said of Peter, you, 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 you know what? Your, you, your speech betrayed you, that you have been with him. And, and we should so soak in the word, so be influenced by the presence of God, that when people see us, they will see that, that as a result of having spent quality time in the word. Our husbands, our husbands should know who we are as a result of the fact that we've been with God. Our children should be able to honor the God we serve because they know that, that the parenting that we are is as a result that we've been with God. In fact, cute short story. Uh, my middle child is, if you know anything about the temperaments, she's choleric. And so, you know, you're born with whatever your temperament is. And so uh, I started reading Beverly LaHaye's book. She was about five years old. And today she's actually 40, how old is she? 44. But at the time she was five. And so I'm reading this book my husband and I, we are just rededicated our lives to the Lord and we just want to be godly parents. So my desire is to be a godly wife, a godly mother, a godly woman. And as I was reading this book, I was like, God, show me, teach me how to connect with each one of my children. Because I had read where uh, Menorah, Samson's mother, the angels came to them and said, this child is a proper child. This child is going to be special, that God is going to use him to begin to deliver Israel from the Philistines. And so uh, the parents were given special instructions. 
for raising the child. And when I saw that illustration, I said, well, God, if you gave his parents special instructions for raising him, you can give us special instructions for raising our children. And I had three children and I wanted three sets of instructions because none of your children are the same. And so I wanted God to give me three sets of instructions. And ladies, I promise you, God is so faithful. God would speak to me in some of the most interesting times and ways and instructing me as it related to each one of my children. First, I wanted to know what their temperaments were and I learned their temperaments. Then I wanted to know what their gifts were and then so that I could know their strengths and their weaknesses, know their apprehensions and their fears so that I could train them and and nurture them in the the ways of God. I knew that I had, um, my daughter was a, a night person. So whenever I wanted to connect with her and just really have teachable moments, I would go in her room at night because she didn't want to go to sleep. So she'd be glad to sit up and talk. And it was just a great opportunity for me to talk to her. But anyway, when she was five years old, my husband and I, we were trying to, you know, do the godly thing and raising them and admonition and of the Lord. So I read this book on understanding and developing your child's temperament by Beverly LaHaye. So as I was reading the book, she's five years old, had no clue of what was in the book, but she was smart enough to make the connection that things had changed. My husband and I, we were in the driver's seat. Cause now when you have choleric children, let me tell you, they will run things. They will take charge. They are your take charge people and they are born that way. And so all of a sudden, at five years old, my husband and I, we in the driver's seat and we are running ahead of her and we were just in charge. And so one day she came to me and she said to me, why are you always reading all of these books? And I said, well, and she looked at that particular book and I said, well, you know what? I said, uh, I really want to be, I got to, I will stand before God to give an account to what kind of woman I am, what kind of wife I am and what kind of mother I am. And so I want God to give me instructions on how to train you and how to, you know, how to nurture you. And so (laughs) this book is helping me. And she looked at me with her little five-year-old self with a lot of confidence and said, you don't have to read all of those books. You are doing just fine. (laughs) And it tickles me every time I think about it. Because what I realized was she saw that we were large and in charge and that we were in the driver's seat as parents. And I said, Lord, thank you so much. And I began to read the book even more intensely. And even now with having adult children, with their spouses, I still ask God to give me clear instructions from his book, from his word on how to respond to my adult children. For me, one of the uh, greatest challenges as an intense mother is, you know, standing down and, you know, uh, knowing where the line is. And and I have one that will let me know when I'm crossing the line. But, and then being a godly mother-in-law to my son-in-law and to my two daughter-in-laws and respecting their personalities and being a grandmother that would uh, pray for my grandchildren and use my influence to to nurture them. And it all comes from the word. The Holy Spirit will speak to us. So in all of these areas, you want to apply the word. You want to read the word. You want to go and find out what the word has to say, because the word is our instruction for godly living. And when we read it, we have to apply it. And when we apply it, we get God's results. And in every one of these areas, God has much to say 
as it relates to our character, because see, that's what transformation does. It forms your character and it makes you an asset to your business. It makes you an asset. So ladies, I have covered a lot of information. I'm going to pray and then we can open it up to, if you have questions, we can do that. But Father, we honor you tonight. We honor you for your word. We honor you that your word was, it was written for our instructions. It was written for us to be reproved. It was written to correct us. It was written to order our steps, Lord. And Lord, we thank you now. We don't want to just be hearers alone of your word. We don't just want to study your word, Lord. We want to apply it. We want to obey it. And so, God, I pray now that you would reveal to us, as you reveal yourself to us through your word, I ask God that as we walk through the process, that you would begin to reveal who we are and that you would begin to give us specific instructions, be it through the direct logos, the rhema, or an oracle. Lord, speak to us. We are listening. God, we want our steps to be ordered by you. We want to surrender and submit to your word. We yield and we say yes. And Father, we ask now that as you would use your word, to examine our hearts. Help us now, Lord, to agree. Lord, we want this word to examine us so that we are not found wanting, but that you will hear our hearts and we will hear your hearts and our lives would be changed forever. We thank you now for the transforming power of your word. We bless your name. We give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. I would also add to examining our hearts as it relates to Matthew 4, 17. These are some other questions to examine your heart. You could ask yourself, have I cried out to God for salvation? What is God convicting me of right now? This is all based on Matthew 4, 17. Have I confessed my sin? Have I, do I have a spirit of repentance rather than just a feeling of regret? Have I turned from the sin of which the Holy Spirit has convicted me? Have I asked God for a clean heart that follows after him? Have I spent time in prayer over my sin? How can I demonstrate my repentance? And I promise you, ladies, as you ask God these questions, God will answer them. He says in Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me and I will show you great and mighty things that you know not. 